what if it was a million dollars? Or for, what if it was the, uh, the real idol of your life, the thing you want most, the thing you think about all day long more than God? And you could say, well, I'll put Jesus off. I won't deny him. I'll put him off. What would happen at that point? Or as we think about the persecuted church around the world, how much of a cost would we pay for Jesus Christ and pay to stay faithful to him? Jesus put the stakes pretty high here in Luke 12. Remember, he's coming from Galilee. He's heading towards Jerusalem. That's our theme as we head into April. And the crowds had been huge. But now they're beginning to winnow down. And he is saying, look, if you want to be my disciple, you need to know about persecution and, and not fearing man last week and having a proper reverence for God. And, uh, and now... He is talking in a very specific way and saying, he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And that's something that is earth-shaking. And so let the word of God make us uncomfortable as well as freeing us. Let's stand for God's word. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. The word of the Lord. Be God. Please be seated. Three principles this morning about confessing Jesus. Um, and they all begin with ultimate. I like the word ultimate. And uh, it's IRA. Can you remember that? The ultimate identification. The ultimate rejection. The ultimate assurance. There you go. I-R-A. And just a little, I don't like acrostics most of the time, but I like that one. So there we go. Let's just deal with the hard verse. The ultimate identification, to be identified with Jesus. I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, will also acknowledge before the angels of God. Ooh. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. We certainly like to identify, don't we? You say, I don't identify with things. You don't? How come you wear so much orange during Bronco time? Because I wear my Bronco jersey because they are what? My team. I am the Broncos. When they win, I win. When I lose, I suffer hardship. You see? But, but sports merchandising across the world is a multi-billion dollar industry. That's why... Kids that come out of tough families or with tough crowd, they want to identify with which team? The uh, Las, Las Vegas Raiders, right. Uh, it used to be in Oakland, but we're in change, in transition here. You know what I'm saying? I, we, oh, you're wearing a Raiders shirt to school, and you got chains. Whoa! Because I find that this particular identity is something that helps me form my own identity. And it's life. It's like, why don't we identify with musical groups or bands or whatever, or pop stars, my goodness, oh my, they have so many followers on Twitter, I am just so jealous of them, and they say so very little, but people identify because they want to be like them, they want to have real life, that's where the action is, if I can live like so-and-so, or be like so-and-so, we don't really know the struggles that so-and-so goes through, though. And the Bible says be careful with that. As a matter of fact, it says the path to growth, it, growth is this. Do not be, what? Conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind because there's a, there's a stream. It's like swimming upstream. It's flowing. It's a, bringing everyone along with this massive current. And the world resists those who would identify 
too closely with Jesus. No, I think we have to take that seriously in 2017. And it's not about politics. It's just about a reality. The times they are a changing, as Bob Dylan once said. The, the secular world is comfortable with us confessing Jesus as long as it's what? A private faith. Go to your church, have your fellowship, hang out in fellowship hall, listen to the sermons, enjoy your choir, but keep out of the marketplace of ideas. Don't be talking to us about the unborn and sexuality and principles of life versus darkness. Keep it to yourself. Keep it in your private religious club. Don't identify with Jesus in the public square. Now, Jesus had already set the tone for this conversation last week. Do you remember when he said, do not be afraid of those who can only what? Kill the body, yeah. But be afraid of him who, after killing the body, can kill the soul, that eternal God. And so what he's doing, he's building. This is a conversation. This is, uh, this is put together in a sequence. He is saying, now, if you realize what reverence for God is, you'll have a respect for people. You'll honor people, but you won't put them before God, and you won't fear them before God. The opinion of God will matter more than the opinion of man. And here's the bottom line here. We speak about union with Christ, union in Christ, to be in him and he in us. We are organically a part of the body of Christ. We take Jesus with us wherever we go. And so it's impossible for us to blatantly deny Christ without breaking his heart. Now, a little bit about this whole text and about the angels and all that. I'm going to throw out a big word, then I'll break it down. What's happening here is the eschatological future has become present. What? Well, it means, yes, and I'm going to simplify it right now. When we speak about receiving the life of God in our heart through Jesus in the Holy Spirit, we're speaking about eternity, the resurrection quality of life. The life of God for all of eternity begins now. Eternity begins now. When you die, it's just a period at the end of a sentence and you move right on. Eternity has begun in your heart. Does everybody see that? The resurrection, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is living in believers. If you get that, shake your head, please. Thank you. If, if Henry's sleeping, wake him right now. Thank you. All right, Henry, he just spoke about something. Okay. And so what is happening? When I speak about the eschatological future, we're speaking about the age to come, and Jesus is what? Focusing on the eternal judgment here. Just as heaven has broken through in our salvation, he's speaking about the judgment of God, which is a heavenly court. And when God is present in his throne, he's surrounded by what? Begins with an A. Angels, good. All right, seraphim, cherubim, they're angels, angelic being. And the angels carry out the judgments of God on the earth. Read the book of Revelation. So he's speaking about the ultimate judging of people before God. Now realize that if you're in Christ, when you stand at the judgment, your sins are already taken care of before the judge. And the Son of God, Jesus, is already pleading for you and advocating for you. Do you see that? Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to have a loss. You're not going to have a loss. But just like when you fail to invest in great companies and they go up 2,000%, you've missed that opportunity. Sinning is a loss. There's a loss of opportunity for all of eternity. But you stand before the throne of God and Jesus Christ has taken your sin. Do you understand that? If you don't, you need to become a Christian. And so he's speaking about that day which has already begun. And he says, the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Now, you say, what if I've had a bad month or a bad year and I'm just scared? First of all, he's not undermining your salvation. That is the sovereign work of God. If you're in Christ, a price has been paid for you and you are eternally secure. But if you're not in Christ, you're alone advocating for yourself 
regarding your own sins. I've often felt that people who go to court and don't allow a, an attorney to speak for them are a little bit arrogant. As if we know the intricacies of the court. I'll defend myself. But, but, but Jesus is saying, look, if you're in Christ, if you've received me, when push comes to shove, you will confess me. Amen? Now, remember Peter. Peter's our buddy. He's the mouthy one. And, and he was the boldest one. He would jump out of the boat and then start to drown. He was always there. He was the one who cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus. And he said, on, if everyone else denies you, Jesus, I'm there. I'm with you to the end. But what, and what did Jesus have to say to him? He said, Simon, Simon, watch out when he repeats your name twice. Remember that? When Satan has sifted you as wheat, the pressures of life, I have prayed for you that when you have fallen, you will strengthen your brother. And so even Peter, the ultimate what? Denier. How many times did he deny Jesus? And what, what made noise? The cock crowed how many times? Three. Easy stuff. He three, seven, or 70. There's only basic numbers in the Bible here. All right? Twelve. There's another one. The cock crowed three times. He's a denier. He's a denier. He's a big mouth who didn't follow through. He's just like us. But the Lord Jesus says, when the pressures of life have come and you have blown it, you've said, no, 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 I don't belong to him. I never knew that man, Peter said. That's not me. He had three different explanations. And he was hanging out with his Galilean accent, which is really distinct in Israel. And he stood out like a sore thumb. And yet Jesus loved him and used him in a great way. But let the text be the text be the text. When the time comes in subtle ways or big ways, in this life and before the ultimate court of the universe, and you say, I stutter like Moses when I speak. I fear speaking like Moses. I can't put together two words in a sentence like Moses. I need Aaron to help me speak like Moses. Please come along and help me speak, Pastor Doug. Help me, help me, help me. But I know that I belong to Jesus. And even if my life was taken out, I would never deny him. Because he has given everything for me. Amen? So let's let, that, let's let the text bother you. Don't say it was a nice sermon. It's an annoying sermon. And it's there to remind us how easy it is to say, no, not me. I, mean, I just go to church. You say whatever you do. What you, it doesn't matter. I keep my religion private. No. I belong to Jesus Christ. And wherever he takes me, I will follow. All right. Second is the ultimate rejection. Remember IRA, identification, rejection, assurance. Now, I know you've thought about this verse. Those of you that have had, read the Bible, those of you new to the Bible, will think about it. Because this is one of the most asked questions about the Bible. Did you know that? For everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Have you ever wondered about that? Well, guess what? If you're worried about that, this doesn't apply to you. And Jesus is making a distinction between two kinds of error. One involves all of us. Peter saying stupid things or not saying the right thing. Keeping quiet when we should speak up. The one who says the wrong thing or doesn't say anything about the Son of Man is us in our life. And we will be forgiven because we're in Christ. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Now, I think the answer to this is fairly easy, believe it or not. To blaspheme against the Holy Spirit ultimately is to say the work of God in Christ in his atoning death either didn't happen or doesn't matter is irrelevant. In other words, 
I reject the ultimate sacrificial loving grace of God and provision for my sin and I say that God did not come in Christ and my heart is please hear this persistently hardened to the grace of God and if you're saying well I hope I don't do that I hope I don't do that I hope I don't do that you're already not guilty of that because you don't want to do that. You say, no, no, no. I, I'm drawn to Christ. I'm drawn to Christ. He's my everything. I certainly don't want to be in that group. He's speaking about those whose heart remain hard. Now, I know some of you are thinking this. Well, I thought it was God who had to regenerate the heart in the first place. How can that be? Well, that's the whole question of election and predestination and the mystery of God. And, and it's a lot for this morning, so we're not going to take all that up other than to say that if you confess Jesus Christ, it is the gracious, sovereign working of God regenerating your heart, enabling you to see and to confess Him as Lord. And the ultimate rejection is to say, I don't need Jesus Christ. I refuse the grace of God. Now, that shouldn't make you say that's a nice sermon. You should say, this sermon is getting worse by the minute. <laughs> I'm serious. Oh, my. There are eternal consequences. This can't be true. Yes. Yes. This is the very seriousness of turning away from the grace of God to reject God's gift. Do you know the, um, I love the, the parable Jesus gives about the banquet. Do you remember that? I mean, servants are invited to the banquet and they give many different excuses. Does anyone remember that verse? So when I was in high school, back right after the Civil War, <laughs> we, we learned those songs of that little parable. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't bother me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and provisions that cost a pretty sum. Oh, please hold me excused. I cannot come. There we go. So then, uh, <laughs> so then all the smart kids in high school turned the words around. Yeah, I cannot come to the banquet. Don't bother me now, I have married a cow, I have bought me a wife. And then we'd have the whole thing so confused. All that to say is, that, that's a silly song, right? But the song points to the excuses given for not availing yourself to the grace of God. And by the way, that's unbeliever and believer. Because the scriptures say today in Hebrews 3.15, If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. For those for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all who left Egypt led by Moses? All, 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 all. They died in the wilderness. And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So see that we... That they, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And so this is not just for an unbeliever, it's for those who persistently push away from God and miss his rest and don't enter into the things God has for this life for you. And so if the Spirit is speaking to you and to me, move towards obedience. Otherwise, your heart will become diseased and hardened the ultimate rejection but again if you're asking could I blaspheme against the Holy Spirit the very fact that you're asking it is an indication that you would never do that because you have opened your life to Christ amen alright so be careful with that text because your friends are going to ask what does that mean have I committed the ultimate sin you know no there is no ultimate sin other than rejecting Jesus okay as clear as we can be. Three, the ultimate assurance, IRA. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now, one of the great miracles, or the great miracle, is the expansion of the church. 
It's one of the great evidences for the reality of Christ. Did you realize that? In every part of the world, the gospel is growing. And again, the question, how could that happen from this group of 12 misfits like us that went into hiding and only the women had the courage to come out? And how could this motley group of disciples, uneducated Galilean fishermen, who are like any other movement that starts big and ends, as it says in the books of that book of Acts, those who have changed the world have come hither. This is the work of God. In other words, God gives the power and the open doors to expand his work. Some people ask, how is Faith Church still around after 53 and a half years, but who's counting? After all the ups and downs, it's because the Lord God alone allows his church to be used of him in his timing and grace, and it's his mercy that we are allowed to be here today. So, so what does it look like? Jesus Christ is with us and in us. The power of the Holy Spirit is in dwelling believers. Everything that happens in life of eternal kingdom significance is because of an open door by the Holy Spirit. And as we study Christ and worship Christ, Christ, it is the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. It's not good sermons or bad sermons. This is the word of God and Christ is speaking, yes. But the Holy Spirit teaches us of Christ. And if you're wondering, how can I get to know him? How can he be intimate to me? I feel so distant in times. It is the Spirit of God who reveals Jesus Christ to you. And he teaches you. And he guides you into all truth. And he protects you from error. But here's the principle I'm making. In the same sense that Jesus is revealed to us and he becomes real, the Holy Spirit that Jesus is revealed from us. You are a light of the world. Don't put it under a stand. You know, I'll start singing again if you're not careful, this little light of mine, but we'll hold back, show a little resist perseverance here or whatever, and that's not the right word, but and you remember how I've said to you many times that Christ in you speaks to the Christ in me? You go to lunch with another believer and you're not really there to learn from one another and you find yourself encouraged. And I, I've told you those stories that are life-changing and it's not just pastor on pastor. I learn from you. And I see something that you've experienced or something you've struggled with and I see Jesus real in you and it resounds back to me. So Christ is being revealed from you. Nothing about being a pastor or not pastor. It's the whole body of Christ, all right? Christ is revealed. Now, we try to, with our, our selfishness and our crankiness, we try to cover that up. This little light of mine, got to let it shine, all right? But no, no, no. But Christ is revealed from you. And as you go forth, there is this sense, because Jesus Christ is living in you, you may not have a very good sense of words, but all of a sudden, something you say will be life-changing to someone else. And you said, I never, I was just saying something. But the Lord places a certain word on your tongue, a certain sentence, or just one little two or two words. And he gives you the right words to say. This is not about, you know, some pastors could use this as an excuse for not preparing sermons, which is absolutely outside of the Reformed tradition. Oh, you know. Just be lazy all week. Go golfing and I'll come in and open the word and see what God has to say. That comes from the pit of hell and smells like burnt sushi. You know? It's true. I, I mean, I spend most of my week wrestling with it. That's not what the text is saying. You don't have to study anymore. Just go play golf. It's hard now with the snow, I will admit. But... Just don't even worry about it. God will give you the words. No, 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 no. I spend time with God, and we agonize together, and by his grace, he speaks to you, okay? But he's saying that when you face a situation where you feel like you're so dumbfounded, and I can't handle this situation. I can't handle it. I don't know what to say in my family. I don't know what to say here. Or in the bigger level of the courts, a testimony. I, 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 that cat has got my tongue. 
the Lord God will, because he indwells you, will give you the words to say. Amen? And that's an assurance of his presence with us as he's expanding his church all over the world. And by the way, it's only as you step out in obedience that you notice that power. It's not to be sitting here and say, isn't this so great? We have all the power in the world. But it's not until you're weak and you step out that you will know that power. It's not until you feel foolish and say, what am I doing here? Why am I involved in this? That you absolutely try to obey and all of a sudden the power of God is there upon you. It's always based on obedience and action. It's not a nice theoretical thing. Facing your discouragements, facing your depression, and facing your addictions, you step out and the power of God meets you right there. So Jesus said to them, to Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, my Lord, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, On this confession, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray. Lord Christ, we are pretty weak. You say pretty, we're very weak. And we like to identify when it's comfortable. And we like to play around the edges. And when we're in the warm flames of fellowship, we're bold. But when we get into the trials of life, we're very, very hesitant. So thank you that you've identified with us in our sin. You became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth that you don't number our sins against us. You, you forgive us. And so we identify with you, Father, by receiving you as our Lord and Savior through Jesus Christ. And if you've never done that, just pray with me for a second. Lord Jesus, the one who identified with my sins in his perfection, Jesus, I proclaim him and identify with him, and I receive him into my life. And I give him all of my brokenness, and he gives me the life of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Christ in my soul. If you prayed that, you've entered the kingdom of heaven. But, and, and please let me know. And, and Father, for those of us who name the name of Christ, but we're so weak at times, as Vince Lombardi said, fear makes cowards of us. Fatigue makes cowards of us all. We pray that as we identify with Jesus, we are so thankful that you call us your own. And Father, we never want to resist your grace and blaspheme against your Holy Spirit. And we're thankful that you have already told us here that the one who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven because that's us. And your grace has come to us again. And Father, we don't always know what to say or what to do, but we thank you that you go before us. This Christ is not only revealed to us by the Holy Spirit, but from us. And you give us the words in season to speak the word of truth. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. Please stand. And let's shout to the Lord and confess that he is our.